Okay, okay let's go ahead and start with the preview. We are at the near the, at the end of the 12.5 section where we're talking about equations of lines, equations of planes, and there are two formulas that I need to explain to you. Um, the distance from a point to a plane and the distance from a point to a line. So first off, the distance from a point to a plane. We, we, we ended last time talking about the angle between two um, planes is the same as the angle between their normals. This is the example we finished with last time. And so now we move forward to the next slide where we have this plane described by this picture of this parallelogram, and I have this, this point out in space called P1. Now technically there's infinitely many distances to the plane because there's infinitely many points in the plane, and so well, what we really want is the one that's closest, the perpendicular drop, you know, if you were to drop down perpendicular to the plane, we like the distance that's represented by capital D here, and um, it's represented by the blue, yeah, kind of like the, the, the magnitude of the blue vector that's on the slide. So you don't have to understand why this formula is what it is. I'm, I'm just trying to motivate the formula, trying to explain it. At the end, there'll be a nice box if you want to wait for that, then um, that's fine. Our generic point out in space that we're trying to find um, the distance from that point to the plane is called x1, y1, z1. And then our goal is to figure out what is the distance from this point to this plane. The plane is going to have some equation. Um, there'll be a particular point on the plane, we call it p naught. This uh, is down here, p naught. And we're going to say generically, um, it has coordinates x naught, y naught, z naught. We know, we know the coordinates of a point on the plane. We know the coordinates of our point we're interested in. And we're going to use that to help us get the distance from the point to the plane. The last thing we need is the equation of the plane. And that's going to be, uh, well, it's not what I'm here for. Okay, let me just write it in. Equation of the plane is going to be generically ax plus by plus cz plus d equals zero, lowercase d. Okay, that's the equation of the plane. And um, there's two vectors we need. We need the vector from the point on the plane to our point out in space. So we, in that, in that order, so we um, take the coordinates of our point and subtract the coordinates of the point on the plane. So x1 minus x is not, and x, y1 minus y naught, and z1 minus z naught. Okay, we'll call that vector b. And then we want to project this vector onto the normal vector. Um, usually it's uh, when they're together, as far as their initial points, we do the projection. This looks kind of strange where the initial point of one is removed away from the initial point of the other. But but it's the same thing, it's, it's the shadow of the vector onto the other vector. We're going to project the light blue onto the, actually it's supposed to be red at this point, um, but um, that, that projection vector, maybe the blue one, I'm not sure, the red one is, oh, the red one is the, end, the normal vector, N, and uh, we're going to project B onto N, and what we get is the blue, the dark blue vector, and the name of that vector is projection of B onto N, proj B N. And we want to know how long that vector is. The length of that vector, the magnitude of that vector, is our distance d. The magnitude of the dark blue vector that's on the that's on the slide there. But we know how to find the magnitude of the projection vector. It's called the the scalar uh, the scalar um, projection. So it'll be just um, taking and finding the the component of b onto n, and we got a formula for that. All you do is dot them and divide by the magnitude of the one that you're projecting onto. So n dot b divided by magnitude n is going to be what drives our formula for calculating the distance capital D. Okay? And so it could, you know, dot product could be negative. We don't want that. We don't want distance to be negative. And so the, the bars that are in the numerator are absolute value bars, but the bars that are in the denominator are magnitude bars. I really want to use two bars for magnitude and one bar for absolute value, but I'm restricted by, uh, by the notation that the book is using, so I'm going to stick to that. Just remember, if there's a number inside, it's absolute value. If there's a vector inside, it's a magnitude. Okay, and this is going to drive our formula. 
how do you take a dot product between a normal vector and b? Um, what is the normal vector? If the equation of the plane is ax plus by plus cz plus d equals zero, then the normal vector is going to be abc. And we're going to dot that with our b vector, x1 minus x0, y1 minus y0, and z1 minus z0. Well, we've seen that before. If I dot this, it's a times x minus x1 and b times y minus y1, c times z minus c1. All right, that's our numerator. Denominator, that's just a magnitude of n. Uh, but if you want that, um, when we were deriving the formula for the, the equation of a plane, this was part of, this is one of the versions of the equation of a plane, this guy equal to zero. But, but um, in the formula for uh, equation of a plane, if you were to distribute that across, you see exactly your a1x1, your your ax1, your by1, and your cz1. And so um, when it comes time to, to, to distribute across to the other guys, the ax0, and the by0, and the cz0, because the point x0, y0, z0 is on the plane, then the, the, those three distributions have to add up to d. Right? Um, it's not the case that when you take the x1, y1, and z1, you'll get the d. Because the point P1 is not in the plane, but the point P0 is in the plane. So, so, so uh, just look at the formula here for the equation of the plane. Any point that's in the plane should satisfy this equation, especially the point X0, Y0, Z0. So if I take these guys and ship them all over to the other side, I get exactly the D that's in this formula of the equation of the plane. So what does that mean to me? That was our numerator. Our denominator is just the magnitude of n, and that's just a squared plus b squared plus c squared, all underneath the square root. So that is our formula. That's the fancy box that you were waiting for. This is what you're going to use when you're trying to find the equation of a, I mean, the, the distance between a point and a plane. Your point is x1, y1, z1. Your plane is ax plus by plus cz plus d equals to zero. The d that I'm talking about there is when the plane is set equal to zero. Okay, so um, that was the derivation of the formula. Now let's just see, let's do it. Let's work it out for a particular example. Uh, let me, did I not record? No, we're, we're recording, right? And then delete this uh, work here. I want to select it all. Um, I'm going to cut this, delete all of this, and paste that back in. Okay, here we go. Here's a point, here's a plane. Go find the distance. I, I assume it's problem number 42 from our textbook, but so what if it's not? Find the distance between the point and the plane. Use the formula. Okay, this guy would be x1, and this guy would be y1. This would be z1. And here is a, b, and c. But the d, remember, I'm thinking, right? Is it right? Oh, I'm sorry. This is, is this D the same D that I'm talking about? Yeah, that's the same D I'm talking about. So, um, so not this four, but negative four, right? With the equation set equal to zero, two x plus y plus two z minus four is equal to zero. So D is minus four. Okay, great. And our formula for the distance is the absolute value of a times x1, b times y1, c times z1, plus the d, all divided by the square root of a squared plus b squared plus c squared. Simple calculation. Okay, tell me what you get. Let's see here. Uh, Numerator-wise, we get a 4 plus a 2 plus a 6 minus a 4. That's positive, so we don't have to worry about the absolute value bars. And divided by, what is the uh, magnitude of a, uh, uh, magnitude of n? It is uh, 4 and 1, oh, that's convenient. 4 and 1 and 4 underneath a root. That's a 9, so root of 9 is 3. Wonderful, and whatever that is in the numerator, 12 minus 4, 12 minus 4, 8. 8 thirds, that's the distance between that point and that point. Okay, so if I give the formula, this is calculation. Just be careful not to make any small mistakes. And so 
I mean, it's good you were able to follow the derivation if you were, but I wouldn't ask you to derive it. It's just uh, to help you out. Questions on that? OK, that's the distance from a point to a plane. But we also need the distance from a point to a line. In our textbook, though, it's not covered in the explanation part of the textbook. It's covered in an exercise, importantly. So um, this is the uh, this is the explanation here. They don't really derive. This is this is my attempt to try to motivate what the formula is and try to let's see here. Let me let me keep that writing that I just did there. Let me see. So the distance between a point and a line. I have my point x y z. And I have my line. Uh, my line has these generic equations, parametric equations, right? X is x naught plus a t and y naught plus b t and z naught plus z t. That's x, y, and z. Uh, my direction vector for the line is called v. Uh, my point on the line that I know, just like the point on the plane, x naught, y naught, z naught. I have an angle theta that the vector between the points makes with the line, and I'm interested in, once again, this drop-down perpendicular distance. There's infinitely many distances because there's infinitely many points. I want the one that is the shortest, the drop-down perpendicular distance. And so I can set up a right triangle, and I can find the opposite angle, the opposite side to that angle. I can find out what D is because um, the point, uh, they don't call it P1 here, they call it S. But yeah, from P to S, that's a vector, which represents uh, the magnitude of that vector represents the hypotenuse of that triangle. And so the magnitude, so the length of the hypotenuse, the right, sine of that angle is the opposite over the hypotenuse. So the sine of theta is D, this distance that I'm looking for, over the magnitude of PS. And so if I'm looking for D, all I need to do is take the magnitude of PS times the sine of theta. And what's missing then um, from the from what we have now and from the formula that we're going to use is the fact that um, it, it looks like a cross product. Um, the magnitude of one vector times the magnitude of the other vector times the sine of the angle between them is the is the magnitude of the cross product. So if we want to use that in the formula, the vector that we're missing is the vector v. And so um, it's like we kind of multiply and divide by the vector v, of the magnitude of that vector v, and we get this formula here. So I give you a point. I give you a line. You can you can get a point on that line. Remember x not y not z not. I'm sorry. I should have been blown up the whole time. Sorry. Um, x not y not z not is your point that's on the line. P not. A B C is your vector, and you just need to perform this calculation. Take the magnitude of your cross product and divide it by the magnitude of your vector v. Um, you also have to go get this vector P S though, which is once again though going from your point down to the line. Um, so you take your, your coordinates minus the other one. Going from the uh, line up to your point. So it's a simple calculation. There's a brief attempt at trying to explain um, how they come up with that. And so now let's use it in an example. OK. So these are the, the, the few problems in this exercise set that have us doing this. Uh, pick one. Uh, let's pick an even so that if you want to try some of the odds, you can do that and have the answer in the back. Um, 30, no, I don't like 34 is the origin. Uh, 36? 30, 36? 38. 38. 38 it is. 38. In 38, we have the point. Negative 1, 4, 3. OK, great. Now, I have this line, right? But I like to write it like this so I can easily tell what's going on. This helps me out. 10 plus 4t, negative 3, and 4t. It's OK if I leave this gap there. You're going to let me do that? Why do I want that gap there? Because those gaps represent zeros. 0 plus 4t, and negative 3 plus 0t. I want those zeros there because I want to be able just to visually just Tell exactly what the point is. 10, negative 3, 0. That's my point P naught. And the other um, numbers here represent the vector V. I, J, and K. 4, 0, 4. So I like to write them vertically like this, but you can write them horizontally if you want. It's fine. As long as you can tell me what the point is, tell me what the vector is. And so I think in the formula they call this S and they call this one P. But so what? We need the vector 
from here to here, from P naught to S. What is that vector? We take S, S's coordinates and subtract P naught's coordinates. So I take negative 1, subtract 10. I take negative 3, subtract 4. Sorry, that, that's out of place there, that little comma. And then I take, um, uh, sorry, I take uh, 0 and subtract 3. That gives me one of my vectors in my formula. Uh, what is it? It's negative 11 and negative 7 and negative 3, if I'm not making some small mistake. I'm making a small mistake. Oh, I switched up. Why, why did I do that? I'm sorry. Um, yeah, 4 take away a negative 3, and um, 3 take away 0. Sorry about that. It just makes a big difference. You know, it's a big mistake to make. Okay, what are you supposed to do with this? I have my vector v. I have my vector p naught to s. Uh, the formula for the distance is the magnitude of the cross product between these guys. Divided by the magnitude of v. Okay, let's go find a cross product. Um, I and J and K, negative 11 and 7 and 3, 4 and 0 and 4. What is our cross product? Cross out the I row, cross out the I column, we get 28 minus nothing. Cross out the J row, cross out the J column, we get negative 44, take away 12, but then remember, we have to negate that. Cross out the K column, cross out the K row, and we get 0, take away 28. So that's our cross product. It is 28. This guy here is 56. And then negative 28. Something shouldn't sit right. You shouldn't want to leave it like that because you have to now go get the, the magnitude of that. You don't want to use those numbers. You have to recognize that you can pull something out. And so we pull that out and make our life easier when it comes time to find the magnitude of that vector. So we pull out 28, right? 28 times 2 is, is 56. So it is exactly 2 times the vector. Don't drop the 2. The 2 is going to be important, though. 2 times the vector, 1. I'm sorry, 28 times the vector, 1, 2, negative 1. 28 times the vector, 1, 2, negative 1. Okay. If I want to know how long that vector is, I can take the 28 and, and at the end multiply by the magnitude of that vector, 1, 2, negative 1. It's the scaling of that vector by a factor of 28. Okay, the vector 1, 2, negative 1 has a magnitude of the root of 6. The vector 1, 2, negative 1 has a magnitude of the root of 6. Okay. So the magnitude of our cross product is 28 root 6. Are okay with that? And then the magnitude of our um, vector v is um, the root of 32, which is 4 root 2. Right? We have a 16 plus 0 plus 16 all underneath a root. That's the magnitude of v. So the root of 32. And 32 is, is uh, 16 times. 2, pull out the 4. So we're looking at this, and it cancels nicely. We end up with 7 times the root of 3 as the answer to the distance between that particular point and that particular line. Okay, it's not in the, the um, explanation part of the text. It doesn't, they don't give you this formula until the exercise part of the text. But here we are, and I showed you kind of how to derive it. It was very quick. And that officially finished off section 12.5. Any questions? Okay, you're going to find an equation of a plane. You're going to find an equation of a line. Know their interactions. How does two planes intersect? How do two lines intersect? Know how to find the distance between the point of the line, distance between the point of the plane, angle between two planes. All these things are necessary. All right? Great. Let's move on. Um, do I want to keep all that? Yeah, why not? It looks, looks messy right now. I'll go with it. Let me save it. I have to remember to, to upload this. Um, I don't want this though. There's something here I don't want. Uh, 
What's going on here? I don't want this thing. Okay, good, save it now. All right, so now we're gonna jump to 12.6. It's a total change in pace. Um, we did 12.1, which is kind of introduction to 3D, and then since 12.2, we've been doing vectors. 12.2, introduction to vectors, 12.3, dot product, 12.4, cross product, and then in 12.5, we kind of put these ideas together, and we're able to calculate the equation of a plane, equation of a line, and all their interactions. 12.6 is a break away from that progression where we start looking at three-dimensional shapes. And as far as what I want you to take out of 12.6, it's just a matter of being able to look at an equation and know what shape it is. As far as drawing it, I don't expect you to be able to draw it, but we have to be able to recognize which, which shape it is and some of the aspects about that shape. So let's jump to the 12.6 notes if there are any questions. Um, generally, when I go over 12.6, I also go over 11.6. It's an optional part to the text. And so um, what will end up happening is the 11.6 um, the notes, I'll just take those and, and um, do a little video on that and then post that video. Um, it, it looks at conic sections. If you don't know what the equation of an ellipse is, it looks at that because here we're talking about the equation of ellipsoid, kind of like the three-dimensional three analog of that. If you don't know what the equation of a hyperbola is, then um, then it would help to know that ahead of time. So when I give you the equation of a hyperboloid, you can say, oh, it looks just like that with another variable added on. Kind of like what we did for a circle to a sphere, you kind of add another variable on. So anyway, let's take a look at section 12.6 now. And um, at the end, there's a nice summary. So if we make it to the end, hopefully, um, we get to that summary. Here we go. So first up, the first shape we're going to worry about is called an ellipsoid. Okay, peel, football looking shape. Um, it's an ellipse in every kind of a plane perpendicular to the coordinate planes. So what those green lines, I, I don't know, it's kind of hard, especially if, you, if you're like somewhat um, colorblind, the green, the blue, and the red kind of all run together. Sorry about that, but um, this is the picture from our textbook. The, the, um, the green are ellipses parallel to the YZ plane. The blue are ellipses parallel to the XY plane. The red are ellipses parallel to the XZ plane. And so when you do the following, you take your three-dimensional shape and you slice it with the plane, you have a, what's called a trace of this of whatever you know shape it um, on the on that plane will be you know what you when you slice it off at and, that, and so when we say the trace of something it's taking a three dimensional shape slicing it with the plane doing that plane is is parallel to one of our coordinate planes and that's going to help us with our naming of these things and so the equation of an ellipse looks like what we have there without the z part. The generic equation of ellipse is x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals to 1. So we just add z. z squared over some c squared equals to 1. And so that's the equation of ellipse. So in all the traces parallel to these coordinate planes are ellipses. So it's an ellipsoid. If a and b and c are all the same, just like with, a, um, with an ellipse, if you take a and b and make them the same, you, get a, you actually get a circle. So with an ellipsoid, if A and B and C are all the same, you'll get a sphere. Because you can factor it out and multiply it over, and you have a, it doesn't have to be centered at the origin, but this one is. If you didn't want to center it at the origin, you want to move it someplace, just like what you did with the sphere, it'd be X minus H quantity squared and Y minus K quantity squared and some Z minus whatever quantity squared. Okay? But this one right here just happens to be centered at the origin. Okay, sounds good. Ellipsoid. Okay, great. Hyperboloid. <coughs> Technically, of one sheet, the nuclear reactor shape. Okay, that means there must be some hyperboloid of two sheets, which is kind of next. This is one continuous shape, and so we call it a hyperboloid of one sheet, and the next one's going to have some kind of break in it. It's going to be two sheets. Okay? The, uh, the, the equation for a hyperbola looks like, almost exactly like the equation of a, an ellipse, but it has a minus when you have a plus. So if we go to add another variable, we have to be careful about you know, where the minus goes, basically. So here's the idea. You take the x squared over a squared, the y squared. This particular version of the graph here, this graph, has this as its equation. 
So how do you know whether it's going to be opening along Z or opening along Y or opening along X? Whichever variable has the negative on it is going to be the direction in which it opens up in. Okay? And so we have this, um, this idea of what are the traces again? And so traces in red are parallel to the XZ plane. Those are all hyperbolas. You have the, the sort of the one branch of it and the other branch of it from the above. You get hyperbolas when you trace somewhere parallel to the XZ plane. You get hyperbolas when you trace parallel to the YZ plane. Those are the green guys. It's hard to see, so hard to see. But when you trace parallel to the XY plane, you don't get hyperbolas. In general, we're going to say they're ellipses. If z was a constant, you can add that over. You have the equation of ellipse somehow. And so if you slice parallel to the xy plane, the blue, I don't know if you can even see it, but the blue are ellipses. So horizontal traces are ellipses. That's parallel to the xy plane. The vertical traces are parallel to the, to the to yz and the xz. And those guys are hyperbolas. A hyperboloid, and it's all one sheet. There's no, there's no break in it. And the axis of symmetry, the, 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 the axis that we're opening up to, corresponds to the variable that has the negative in front of it. It stands out in the, in the, in the equation, it stands out. And so that's going to be the direction. If I want to take this thing and turn it and have it open in terms of y, I better put the negative on the y, keep the other guys positive. Questions? It is just, it is just, I know, I'm sorry about this, but we have to go through this because later we're going to be doing things with these shapes. So this is all about recognition, not about drawing. Um, just um, here's an equation, kind of, kind of have an idea what the shape looks like, so we can do things with it later. So just bear with me as we go through. It. So, all right, so that's a hyperbola of one sheet. Here comes a hyperbola of two sheets. What's different is the traces um, are, are different. So you still get horizontal traces that are ellipses. But there's this gap here between the two. Okay. What's different in the equation is that instead of only one negative involved, you have two negatives involved. So there's a negative on the x squared, negative on the y squared, not a negative on the z squared. And this is what the graph of it looks like. It opens up and down in z. So how do you know how it opens? The one guy that stands out. The variable that stands out this time is the one that has the, pop, the plus, the positive coefficient when you're in the standard form. So vertical traces are hyperbolas. Your vertical traces are the guys that are parallel to the XZ plane, the red guys, parallel to the YZ plane, green, I think. Okay. And then um, the horizontal traces are also ellipses, but there's this gap. Okay, So it, it has the same name as the other one, hyperboloid, because of the fact that we have you know, this, this action going on with the traces, but there's this gap. And don't worry about this detail that I'm about to tell you about the gap. But um, I, I, got, I have to go into it. So anyway, um, as long as z is uh, in between some, some minus k and k. Oh, I'm sorry. Where is this thing going? Don't worry about this detail here. I just want to. So, so there's some k here and some minus k. All right has nothing to do with these numbers that are down here, but so, so, so if I'm in between there, if the absolute, oh wait, what's the C? Oh, the C, actually no, this is the C, I'm sorry, minus C and C, and then K, if K lives in between here, think about what this means, Z equals K. What is Z equals K? Z equals K is a plane that has uh, the fact that it's parallel, it's a plane parallel to the XY plane. Okay, it's, it's a horizontal plane. It's a, and so, if, if I'm in this gap area here, then I won't have anything. Okay, um, I need to be outside of this gap area. I need K to be bigger than C in absolute value. So I can get down here to get my elliptical traces. So um, this is C, I'm sorry. And I don't want K to live in here. I want K to, to live outside of here. I would like for K to be bigger than C in absolute value. Then I will have traces. Otherwise, I don't have traces. 
And how do you know who it opens up with? The one that has the positive coefficient. All right, great. So we saw an ellipsoid, and then two different versions of hyperboloids. One with this gap and one without the gap. The one without the gap is one sheet. It has one negative. The one with the gap has two sheets and it has two negatives. Whatever it takes to help you realize things easier. Question. All right. Cone. Technically, this is an elliptic cone. It's only up and down in Z. And the equation looks different than the ones we've seen so far. Okay, all the ones we've seen so far had all the guys squared and it was set equal to one. This one doesn't have that. It still has all the guys squared, but it's not set equal to one. One of the variables is solved for, and so it's that that's what's gonna isolate it. The one that's isolated, the one that's solved for basically, is gonna be the direction in which it opens up and down, or left and right. And so so um, if I had the y over there, I'd be open along the y-axis, or if I had the, the x over there, I'd be open along the x-axis. Because I have the z isolated on the one side, I'm opening up and down on, on the z-axis. Still sitting at the origin because um, I don't have this x minus h part. What about traces? Okay, the red traces, what are those called? Hyperbolas, and the green as well. Okay, so parallel to the x-z plane, parallel to the y-z plane, I get hyperbolas. My, my vertical traces are hyperbolas. My horizontal traces, parallel to the x, y plane, I get ellipses. When I slice something parallel to the x, y plane, I get ellipses. So I have vertical traces, hyperbolas, and horizontal traces, ellipses. And so I'm an, I'm an elliptic cone. Okay. Don't worry about this detail, but I have to actually throw this in here. Um, so, so I have this point here, which is the origin right now. But if I were to slice a certain kind of way, like, it, like if I were to use z equals zero, the x, y plane, I'd only have the point. Okay? And so, as long as um, I slice with some x equals K, that's the uh, x equals is letting y and z be whatever you want it to be. I think those are the green guys, the green hyperbolas. And the y equals k are the red hyperbolas, I believe, yeah. Um, but if this value of k is zero, if I, if I use x equals zero, if I use y equals zero, and I slice, I'll end up with these, these lines that d define the, uh, the column, okay? And um, and of course it opens up on the axis that is on the left hand side of the for. Okay, so that's different. The first three kind of get grouped together, and then there's this one which is separate from that. The first three are kind of grouped together because they're all set equal to one. This one's separate because it's not. They all have all variables squared though, and so. Now we're going to relax that and let one of the variables not be squared. We get what's called a paraboloid. So it has the same kind of equation as the cone, but take, take the one variable that's on the other side and make it the one that's not squared. It doesn't really matter about the constant being squared or not. You can always you know, make, it, make it something that's a square or not a square. That doesn't matter. But just changing z squared into z changes the shape drastically. It's not a cone anymore. It's a paraboloid. Technically an elliptic paraboloid. Okay? Red guys are parabolas. The green guys are parabolas. The blue guys are ellip ellipses. So the horizontal traces are ellipses, and the vertical traces are parabolas. That gets the name paraboloid. How do you know where it's going to open up at? To which, um, to which variable is your axis of symmetry? The one that's solved for on the left hand side. Paraboloid, a bowl. Okay, this is markup. This is very different than the last four we had because one of the variables isn't square. It looks a lot like a cone equation. But with the cone equation, all the variables are squared. Sorry, I need to look at this, but 
All right. So that was an elliptic paraboloid. So there's another kind of paraboloid called a hy um, hyperbolic paraboloid. This is my Pringles chip. <laughs> Saddle is probably better. Okay, wait. So the way it got its elliptic name is because that the horizontal traces were ellipses, while the other guys were parabolas. So if the horizontal traces are hyperbolas, which they are, the, the blue guys, if I slice it parallel to the xy plane, I get I get one branch of the parabola, on the other side I get the other branch of the parabola. It's kind of hard to see. So so I get I get um, hyperbolic, um, I get hyperbolas for my horizontal traces. I still get the parabolas for the red guys and the parabolas for the, the green guys. Um, the red guys are parabolas open up. The green guys are parabolas open down. Okay. But how do I know the orientation of this guy? How do I know? You know, why is this looking like this and not turned, you know, now you, and that's not an easy question to, ask, um, to, to answer. And so it's based on this equation, though, where what happens when, when um, what happens if you let one of them be zero, when, what will you be looking at? If I let x be zero, right, what that means to me when x is zero is I'll be looking at some equation that basically looks like z equals minus y squared. Okay, x is zero. What does that mean visually? If x is zero, then I'm talking about the yz plane. Here's the here's the yz plane. X is zero. I'm living on this yz plane. I should have a parabola that opens down in y squared like this. I should get these green guys. But if I let y be zero. Then I'm looking at something that basically looks like z equals x squared. I should have parabolas that open up. y equals zero is the is the xz plane. That's this plane here. And and oh, I just messed up. Sorry, that looks terrible. I should have did that. Oh well. All right, you get the point. Oh no. Too many clicks. This computer. All right, well, three, four minute break as I try to recover here. Control, I'll delete. Too many clicks. Can't handle so many clicks at a time. I don't know, close them all. Yeah, it's like, it's like. What time is it? Is that a sign we should just stop? <laughs> Friday. All right. All right. Have a good weekend.